So I'm going to start out with uh, just explaining whoop, what I'm going to do here. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is just go over kind of the terminologies and the frameworks that informed my most recent project, The New Faith, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about that specifically. Most of the music that you're going to hear tonight comes either from The New Faith, which came out about a year and a half ago now on Smithsonian Folkways Recordings, or my more recent project, which I can't tell you very much about tonight because my label would be very mad at me if I did, but... Uh, you'll hear little pieces of that throughout the evening. And uh, I think many of the same principles and concepts apply. So I wanted to start by talking about black music making in general. Uh, I come to all of this from the perspective of someone in the traditional music sphere. So when I entered the field of professional musicianship, it wasn't as a songwriter, it wasn't as a composer, or even really as an arranger. It was as someone who went through archives, digging up old songs, learning to perform those in the best and most loyal way that I could. And oftentimes what that means in my community is that you try to erase yourself from the music, that you are just a channel for this very old thing. And I think in some ways that's a little bit of, of a twisting of a concept here that uh, the jazz legend Sidney Bechet uh, talked about in his autobiography, Treat It Gentle, which if you haven't read it, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous piece of work. I highly recommend it. And he talks about this thing called the long song that he talks about as being kind of the defining trait for grounded and competent jazz musicianship back in the day. So he's talking about uh, hearing a relationship between music and ancestry. In his case, he talks a lot about his grandfather, Omar, and he gives us a really nice little view into how he sees that, that long song being carried by many people over the course of history. So the quote is, it was the feeling of someone back there hearing the song like it was coming up from somewhere. No matter where it's played, you got to hear it starting way behind you. There's the drum beating from Congo Square, and there's the song starting in a field just over the trees. The good musicianer, he's playing with it, and he's playing after it. No matter what he's playing, it's the long song that started back there in the South. So the message here, of course, is that we're engaging with a much older text, even as we're performing it in a new way. And one of the interesting things about Bechet's conceptualization of this process, as opposed to the way folk music often gets portrayed today, is we tend to fossilize it. When I tell people that I study folk music, uh, that I'm getting a doctorate in folk music, they tend to assume that I'm a historian and that what I do is go back into archives and try to reenact things as closely as possible. And there are people that do that. It is very, very difficult. Difficult. There's great merit in pursuing that skill set. But what I find really interesting here is how Bechet articulates the need to play after the song as well as with it, that you are respecting your own positionality, the time that you were born in and the time that you're creating and the people you're creating for, as well as this legacy of which you are part. Now, Samuel A. Floyd, whose book cover is up here, engages with this text in a really beautiful way. Uh, well, he's trying to kind of dissect what makes black music tick as an art form or a set of many different art forms. He says, for Bechet, black music making was the translation of the memory into sound and the sound into memory. And I think that's a really lovely way to think about the feedback loop that's happening there, right? You're taking this old song, it's finding its way out into the world through you, and then in the same instant, the sound that you're creating then and there re-enters into the historical canon. So the memory is coming out of you in the form of sound and the sounds that you make are then entering other people's memories where they will then reemerge much later. And we're gonna come back to that loop idea over and over again during the course of this talk. So when Samuel A. Floyd talks about memory, he's not just necessarily talking about our personal individual memories, right? Uh, we all have stories in our heads about the way that we grew up and the things that we were close to and in touch with during the course of our childhood and our upbringing. Uh, and of course, even those get distorted over time. But what I'm really interested in is this idea of cultural memory that Samuel A. Floyd spends a lot of time on. So he defines it as non-factual and non-referential motivations, actions, and beliefs that members of a culture seem without direct knowledge or deliberate training to know that feel unequivocally true and right when encountered, experienced, and executed. It may be defined as a repository of meanings that comprise the subjective knowledge of a people, its imminent thoughts, its structures, and its practices. Which is a very uh, heady way of saying in, in 
simpler terms that your cultural memory is what teaches you how to act, right? You, you know when you do something, what would my father, what would my grandfather, what would my grandmother think of what I'm doing right now? Uh, that type of thing or recognizing music that maybe you haven't personally heard before and saying, oh, I'm in that. That is a sound of me. And I'm going to play uh, one example off my album, The New Faith Now. You will hear this performed live later tonight, but it's going to sound different because it's a live show. Um, I'm going to play you a little bit of that, and then we're going to talk about how cultural memory and the long song manifested in that production process. So this is one called Once There Was No Sun. So I always bring up this song as an example for, for the cultural memory conversation because there were several layers of that in play when I put this idea together. So I made this record during uh, COVID lockdowns. I was alone in my house and kind of sending things back and forth with a co-producer who did most of the percussion and the rest of the stuff on here I did myself. And um, it was real interesting as I put the song together to discover all of these layers of cultural memory that were in play. For example, um, this whole album is about climate change and our relationship to the natural environment. So listening to this song, Once There Was No Sun, I heard this beautiful statement of kind of gratitude uh, for the fact that there is a sun now uh, and that there wasn't always one, that we can't take all of these beautiful things around us that bring beauty to the world and also sustain our lives to be there forever. I felt like that was just something I was bringing to the table, probably a totally ahistorical reading of the song. And then when this video came out, uh, it debuted in Rolling Stone and the journalist who wrote it up found a recording of Bessie Jones, whose recording I learned the song from, talking to the folklorist Alan Lomax and saying, this song is about how grateful we are to God for the beauty of the world around us. So having never heard that recording, having never heard her talk about it, having never met her, right? She died before I was born, um, or at least when I was young. Um, I managed to figure out this kind of specific reading of what this text is, despite the fact that the text is not very clear as to what it's trying to say. When I was arranging it, I decided to really root it in this kind of banjo and drum pairing, which has been done a couple times in, in the modern age, most recently by a band called The Horseflies, uh, who I and my bandmate Gus Trich have both learned a lot from. So you'll hear a couple songs from them actually later tonight. But it has been treated as kind of this hippie innovation that people started doing in the 1970s. And what I learned is that, so I took the banjo part for this from this very old manuscript that was published by a man named Hans Sloan, who was named the uh, personal physician to the British governor of Jamaica in the early 1680s and collected several tunes that he heard enslaved African people playing in Jamaica during this time. And he drew the instruments that he saw them playing and wound up uh, with the assistance of a far more musically competent enslaved African musician named Mr. Baptiste, transcribing three to five pieces of music, kind of depending on how you count them. One of them might be three different ones all posted in there under one name. Um, 
he draws the instruments that these things were being played on, and it's quite clear they're early banjos. These are gourd banjos that were made by kind of cutting the top off a calabash or a gourd, stretching an animal hide over it, and using some animal gut strings. That's how they used to be created. And he calls them um, a strum strump, I believe, in that, in that particular manuscript. But if you look at it, it's quite clear what it is. I discovered after making this album, uh, a couple years later, my friend Christina Gaddy put out this really amazing book called Well of Souls, which if you're interested in the development of early black folk music or specifically the black banjo tradition, you need to get the book. Um, there's a whole chapter in there about Hans Sloan and his experience uh, being in Jamaica at the time that he was, having this very complicated relationship of someone who was pro-slavery winding up uh, falling very deeply in love with the music that he heard enslaved people playing and the, the complexities of that relationship. What also emerged that I find very interesting is that the banjo in this era was played alongside a set of drums. There was a large drum and a small drum, much like we see uh, in Garifuna drum traditions these days. And we used Garifuna drums on this track. Uh, feeling that they were appropriate, again, not knowing that history. So this is an example, again, of uh, kind of letting the intuition guide us to where we thought the song wanted to go and then discovering that it's actually where the song came from originally, that memory is emerging in the sound over and over again. And by the same token, I have now brought this thing back that may be uh, a little bit more... Uh, may involve uh, the, the earlier performance styles in a more significant fashion. Uh, and this is now in the archive of the Smithsonian Institution, right? This will go on forever. So uh, this is me leaving my sounds in the memory and in the archive so that other people can come back and explore them later. And that lays the groundwork for what Isaiah Lavender III calls Black Network Consciousness. I'm a huge fan of this book. If you haven't read this book, you should read it. Um, the essential idea of the black network consciousness is that uh, our shared forms of expression, whether those be songs, whether those be poems, whether they be like quotable speeches, right? Think about certain passages from the I Have a Dream speech, for example, or like letter from a Birmingham jail, right? We have these kind of addresses written and spoken and various types of verbal oral performance that we share and that have certain subtext when shared amongst members of a culture that they might not when shared otherwise. So he talks about this being able to organize the community, right? That if one person writes a song, teaches it to the, you know, three other people, those three people teach it to three people. Now you have so many people who all have this song in common, who all understand something jointly in the way that the song is supposed to function. And we can maybe see a more sophisticated version of that taking place when we think about folks like Harriet Tubman, who would use spirituals as signals for the Underground Railroad operations at the time, right? These were not only just uh, art forms being passed from individual to individual, they were coded messages. This was a coding technology that was innovated very early on in our country's history and has seldom been treated as such. So this quote from Isaiah Lavender III, I think, strikes at the heart of it. A black networked consciousness suggests that through Afrofuturism, communal memories and traditions which link the past, present, and future make possible the hope that black people wish to experience from a painful past in building black futures. So through, again, this communal memory, right, cultural memory, we're all kind of getting onto the same page here, uh, these shared forms of expression enable us to connect not only with the people who are around us in the now, right, people who we might be singing various songs with or teaching songs to or learning songs from, but also the people that they learn the songs from, whether or not those people are still alive. We now have the opportunity to skip links in that chain because recorded music exists, right? It didn't used to be that I could go log onto my computer and commune with the electromechanical reproduction of a dead person to learn a song, but here we are. It's a very science fictional practice learning this old music. And I think that as I Lavender III strikes really neatly at the heart of that in this book, despite the fact that he's mostly talking about literature. We'll, we'll forgive him the blind spot. He talks about this thing called the transhistoric feedback loop, which I gave a nod to earlier when I was talking about that transformation from memory into sound, which then enters into memory again. That may be one uh, specific instance of what he calls the transhistoric feedback loop. He talks about how 
in imagining black futures, we are able to uh, adjust expectations or ideas about the black past, that uh, we are able to bring new ideas to the table that let us understand old things in new ways. And then those old things change. History changes because we tell the story in a different way. And that creates an avenue for even more change going forward. The past and the future are constantly altering one another in this endless cycle. So we can think about that in terms of once there was no sun, where I went into it with a very specific political and, you know, a kind of just emotional human message that I wanted to share with people that I did not know to be related to the core message of the song as I learned it, turned out that it was, right? And my trying to make that message very explicit in the way that I shot the video, in the way that I framed the album when I put it out, means that now people who go back and listen to that song, especially if, say, you're at this talk or you're at the show later, you might go back to that song, understand the song in a different way. And that might not only teach you to listen to Once There Was No Sun in a different way, it might teach you to listen to all of Bessie Jones' songs in a different way. It might teach you to listen to all of that historic material in a new way. So by inventing these distant futures that we project ourselves into, we open new understandings of the past that, again, open new understandings of the future, which open new understandings of the past. It's all feeding back into itself the whole time. Big fan of Abdul al Kalimat. Uh, this is a really great book, The Future of Black Studies, which is really about the field, but he talks about Afrofuturism quite a bit in it. And what he defines as the three types here are imagination as the basis for the future, the historical past as the basis for the future, and creating the future through the struggle for social change, both reform and revolution. There's been a movement recently among scholars to expand the definition of Afrofuturism, right? This is a coin that was termed, uh, well, this is a term that was coined in the 1990s. And the more that we come to contemplate what it actually is and how it functions, the more we start to realize that there were people who were doing this work the entire time. If we're thinking about imagination as the basis for the future, every spiritual that talks about heaven becomes an Afrofuturist work because it's imagining a future for the person singing it. Every book that was written by, say, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Jacobs, that entertained the idea of uh, America without slavery was a speculative work, was an entry into the canon of Afrofuturism. So we can then go back hundreds of years, look at these things that we've been taught to consider are pretty concrete and mundane, and understand that there is a really ambitious, futuristic endeavor taking place, even in those works that precede the creation of this term by centuries in some cases. The historical past is the basis for the future is another interesting element here. This is like where I sit, right? This is home for me, that we look back at our past and use that to divine what the future might look like. In creating the new faith, my task was to envision a post-climate crisis future for black people in this country. Um, I say post even though, you know, does the crisis really stop once it has begun? This is unclear. But the idea is that we've gotten through the collapse phase of it and have adjusted to some kind of new normal. My way of creating this was to think about the ways that black people have been treated in the past, the ways that human migration has been treated in this country and in other countries over time, thinking about sincerely, uh, from a historical perspective, the obstacles that await us and whether our society as it presently exists can bear the weight of the changes that are coming. And deciding that one, no, it probably cannot. Things are going to change in a really big way. Two, that a lot of people are going to have to migrate from where they live because of storms, because of droughts, because of desertification, because of uh, the death of the ocean <laughs> in its entirety. There's a lot of bad stuff coming down the pipe. People are gonna have to move and it's gonna create a refugee crisis at a time of extreme resource scarcity. That doesn't look so good. And for those of us who are more dark complected in the room, we understand that when we have to move because we're gonna die if we stay where we are, typically it is not well received by the people who, who, whose place we are moving to. So the idea was that these black people from the South move up to the North, kind of fleeing climate change in the way that we see black people moving to the North to flee other types of racialized violence and uh, terror, and are then confined to a refugee camp where they have to 
find a way to make a living. And this is now several generations down the line is when the album takes place. So this is a kind of an ancestral story of the migration, the same way that we treat Exodus today. And these old spirituals, which now we consider to be quite biblical in content, because they are taking place in this post-climate change universe, because they're attached to this mythos of a communal migration from the south to the north because of climate catastrophe, they take on a new tenor, they take on a new meaning. Creating the future through the struggle for social change, both reform and revolution, is pretty straightforward, right? If you are agitating for a change, it means that you're imagining what the world would look like if that change took place. And this is also obviously a key part of what I'm doing. What would be the point of making an album about climate change if I was fine with climate change, right? I'm, I'm hoping to in some way move the needle, even though I know I probably can't. And entertaining the idea that we might live through that is a speculative act, right? Entertaining the idea that our culture will endure even in as distant a form as I envisioned for it uh, is a speculative act. So I tried to weave these three types in as, as I created that work, and they've helped me conceptualize what I'm doing uh, going forward as well with my more recent project. I really liked this quote from Abdul Al-Kalimat. The challenge of speculative thinking about the future is to grasp the fundamental logic of the historical process, prepare a plan for the future, and then to practice an intervention, to participate in and influence the direction of change. Has anybody here read Parable of the Sower? Octavia Butler? I'm in the middle of it right now. Okay, well, I won't spoil anything for you. If you haven't read that book, you should. You, you know, it's, it, she, she knew the future, and it's very spooky. Um, like, the, the book features a, a, a presidential candidate named Donner running under the slogan, Make America Great Again. Oh. And she wrote it in the early 1990s. It's the spookiest thing possible. Um, and that was a, a big model for me in the way that I tackled this work. I wanted to kind of use the same general framework that she did for uh, imagining my future, even though it's much farther ahead. Uh, the Parable of the Sower takes place in our, the time period in which we currently live. Uh, which is a little bit freaky that she knew who would be running for president and also knew that California would be devastated by wildfires. It's very disturbingly specific. But uh, to get back to the point, these are all of the things that I try to do in my work and that people have been trying to do throughout time. Um, the more that we talk about this stuff, the more it comes clear that all of these historical texts are themselves based on earlier historical texts or historical ideas or opinions uh, that ships feature prominently as kind of vessels of struggle, for example, uh, that we're preparing a plan for the future, whether that means the future of your individual eternal soul uh, and thinking I need to live right so that I can go to heaven, whether it's a plan for the community saying we need to take care of each other, we need to replace our corrupt and defunct leadership, uh, and then to practice an intervention to participate in and influence the direction of change. This is why I bring up Octavia Butler, because the fictitious religion that exists in Parable of the Sower is all about uh, intervening in change and affecting the way that it moves. So there's a, a real nice through line here that connects a lot of Afrofuturist work and, and gives us an idea for how to engage with it. I've told you a lot about the new faith already, but <laughs> I want to get to the heart of how it functions in the terms that we've discussed. So you know that it takes place an unspecified number of years in the future, but presumably a few hundred after the current regime in the United States has collapsed under the strain of the climate crisis, uh, where people have gone through mass migrations, life is looking really different. And part of what made this project tick for me is that my task was to reinsert myself into the music. Like I said way back at the beginning for the folks that were here, when you play traditional folk music, you're often expected to erase yourself from it, to become this conduit for an older thing and to not present your own aesthetic or perspective or anything like that. I wanted to do something different from that. And it was really difficult for me to find a way to challenge the expectation that I become invisible without feeling like I was messing up somebody else's song, right? I don't own these. What right do I have to change them? Displacing it several hundred years in the future makes me one of the ancestors who passed down the song, 
right? I am the someone back there being channeled, if we're calling back that Bechet quote about the long song, right? People are channeling me in this album, even though I'm singing for them. So it gives me some agency over the course of the tradition to, to say it will exist this far into the future, and I will be an entry in it, and my contributions to it are therefore valid. The other thing that it does is reshape these old songs uh, to kind of address one potential future that at the time I saw as the most likely future, that I still kind of see as the most likely future, revealing those new meanings in those old songs and stories, right? I did very, very small rewrites of some of these songs. I would replace a line here or there where it was maybe too specifically Christian and I wasn't sure what the Christian religion would be doing at that point in the future. So I didn't want to have Jesus be in there, but I also was like, whatever exists at this point is gonna have shades of Christianity in it. So I kept a lot of the other symbology intact. Uh, changing just the little words that I did made people understand the stories and the lyrics in those songs in a very new way. So again, we have this kind of transhistoric feedback loop thing happening, and I have friends now who are recording and performing their own versions of some of these songs in ways that address very similar topics. It's really nice to, to see it spreading in that way. Hopefully, listening to the album or seeing the show as you're going to instills a sense of urgency. Uh, it makes you want to alter the future because the one that's presented is not necessarily a happy picture. Um, one of the really powerful things about these songs is that they're passed down from people who had no reason to believe that their children's lives would be any better than theirs, who certainly did not think that I would be up here as a PhD student at an Ivy League university giving this talk to you right now. Things have changed a lot in ways that they never could have expected. And singing those old songs can sometimes remind you of that, right? that these were people who were going through something really specific who had very little hope for the future sometimes, but felt like they had to get through it anyway and live the best that they could so that they could respect themselves. And part of that meant setting up their progeny for success. So hopefully listening to those songs, getting that message, uh, inspires other people to do the same. We still have enough time to make the changes that we need to make to minimize the damage, but we don't have very much time. And I think that the task of this time period for all artists really is to get people to wake up to that fact. Uh, it's something that's erased from our public life in this country too often. We don't agree that this climate crisis exists even as it's already destroying homes and killing people and ruining livelihoods, right? It's past time for creatives to enter that conversation in a very serious way, and past time for academics to do so as well, even if we're not in these specifically environmental fields. That's the end of my talk. Um, okay, well thank you. I hope that you enjoyed this, and I hope that you stick around for the show. Thanks for coming.